explore flight, whether to fly by. This is a picture of NASA's Global Hawk. And uh, NASA used a special plane to help uh, hurricane forecasters. This unmanned plane known as the Global Hawk flies at about 60,000 feet, which is about twice the height of a commercial plane. It takes uh, X-ray type, we'll say CAT scans of the inside of a hurricane, such as the towers of heavy rain that help energize the storm. And because this unmanned aerial system, UAS, can stay up for 24 hours, it's great to examine the hurricane head to toe. The other thing is even though it is flying over top of, um, yeah, Julie, no problem. I got your email from where you sent the email, that, uh, your last name from where you sent the email. But because it can fly over top the hurricane, because it's unmanned, there's less um, concern for air pilots here on the ground. Um, because obviously if they're not on the plane, that makes things wonderful. This here was actually stationed out of NASA Armstrong. I used to work out of NASA Armstrong prior to coming to NASA Goddard. And um, I wanna give you a few of the highlights about NASA Armstrong, which makes it such a great place to be a research flight, a flight research center. It is a remote location. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when I worked there, um, I, I drove about an hour to get to base every day. And even once I got onto base, I drove another 15 minutes to get to NASA Armstrong. So to say that it's in the middle of not much of anything would be very much so a true statement. Because of the weather, uh, there are they, they boast of 350 testable days per year. There's an extensive range of airspace, and part of this is because they're part of a supersonic corridor. There's over 29,000 feet of concrete runways. And while 29,000 feet sounds like a lot, there's 68 miles of lake bed runways. And it's all around, you know, there's over 300,000 acres. So to say it's in a wonderful and amazing place to do research is an understatement. And of course, maybe that explains why NASA's predecessor, NACA, started out there at Edwards Air Force Base you know, uh, over 100 years ago. So having said that, that's one of the amazing places that NASA has uh, in its arsenal of places to uh, do research. Um, and I do want to point out, I hope you can see it, this, um, you can see here it says 270, here it says 225, here it would say 310, and you'll have to look behind the writing to see that there's a circle. And it's basically a compass, and they call it the Desert Rose, and it's large enough, you can see this number as compared to this building. I mean, here is a huge airplane next to that number. So those numbers are huge. And the whole point is that that, that desert rose or that that compass can be seen by pilots while flying, which to me is just quite amazing. But again, it's a very large place. And so they have lots of benefits out there. So today with the weather workshop that we're looking at, we're gonna talk about the weather to flyby activity going to talk about the anemometer activity. We'll make some real world connections with the NASA NOAA shout mission. I'm going to share some information that a subject matter expert actually gave me and I'm going to give you his slides as well. And then I'm going to talk to you about a simulation activity. And although it's not in here, but I have three more activities that are all part of the weather to fly by activity PDF that I'm going to show you as well. And of course, at the end, I'll give you the opportunity to both download the PowerPoint and download uh, the activity. As I told you, and I'm going to quickly show you the sidebar here, you can see my notes. I think you can see my notes over here um, in the notes section. And that is true also of the PowerPoint. So as you're doing these PowerPoints, uh, some notes this slide didn't have one, um, but this slide, which is the lesson overview designed to help you write a PDF, and you can see the activities in terms of what we're going to do or NGSS standards, but making connections, you'll see over here to the side, I give you the link to MIB, I give you the link to the specific PDF, and then I give you a summary of what it is. So just to let you know, and I'm not gonna show you those slide bar throughout, because that's what I use uh, to talk to you from, not that I know all of this off the top of my head. So um, that information is there for you in the notes section. So again, this is an inquiry-based lesson that you can use with your students that'll talk about density and other properties that change weather conditions. 
and as such can have an impact on flight and why it's important for pilots to become familiar with these conditions. You can work as a team to engage in these activities to gain a better understanding of the terms air mass and density, how weather conditions are created, and also the instruments meteorologists use to measure wind speed. <clears throat> Different things that we're going to do, but we're just gonna jump right into this today. And yes, we are touching on several NGSS standards. The activity over on the left here, weather to fly by, and it is out of NASA's Museum in the Box Aeronautics uh, Mission Directive Activity. Um, it does say K-8, but I will tell you that for physical science classes, there are definitely some of those items um, out there that, that fit K-12, and we'll talk about some of those today. Um, I am going to focus on the webinar, so if you have questions that specifically relate to what I'm talking about within the webinar, I'll gladly do that, but the other questions in terms of like how you can get qualified to fly one of those planes, if you'll hold on to that until we get to the end, and then I will take your uh, information. Yes, it is an educator guide, which means it not only gives you the questions, but it also gives you the answers. So let's talk a little bit about the science behind that so that we understand Earth's atmosphere and whether is the state of the atmosphere with respect to wind speed, direction, temperature, moisture, and pressure. Weather is primarily dri driven by temperature and moisture differences between two places. For example, I told you here where I'm at in Virginia right now that, you know, we're cold. As a matter of fact, the overnight low was in the 30s. There was a freeze warning um, for the flowers that we just planted for my mom. That was a big concern for us. And yet on Friday, the weather is going to be up in the 80s. So to go from very cold to very high, I know, hey, we're going to have a thunderstorm in the middle. Because when there's different temperatures, it affects the pressure of the air and causes different disturbances. And so whenever you have a different front moving through, a lot of times you get a cold front up against a hot, warm front, um, you're going to have thunderstorms. So, um, And so weather occurs in what's called the troposphere, which is the lowest layer. The tropopause, which is in between the troposphere and the stratosphere, is where weather typically ends. And that's anywhere from five miles above the Earth to the surface of the pole, at the surface of the poles, to as much as 11 miles above the surface at the equator. And um, again, the movement that we talk about of the air up there is what we call wind. So weather and flying. Pilots make takeoff and land. Um, they take off and land in completely different weather conditions, even if they're only flying a few miles. Before pilots take off, it's important that they fully understand how the weather will affect their flight temperature, pressure, wind, clouds, and dew point. Um, strong winds occurring um, can, can create very different pressures. Um, a cloud, while it's different, just you know, molecules of moisture within the atmosphere, you have to be aware of that because of visibility. And the dew point is the temperature at which the um, air will, will it must be cooled in order to reach saturation. Uh, pilots will find that as the dew point gets closer to the current temperature, they'll most likely encounter fog or clouds during their flight, again, impacting visibility. Um, these are some definitions. Wind is the direction and in, in, they need the direction and speed needed for surface and winds aloft. Um, heavy winds are opposite the direction of travel um, and they cause you to need more time to travel because it takes longer. And also in flight, uh, it burns more fuel. Now, tailwind, uh, that flows in the direction of travel and it helps you get there faster and it also helps you to burn less fuel. Now, a crosswind is that one that is flowing side to side of an aircraft. And while during flight, that would have minimal effect, but whenever you get close to the ground, trying to get that aircraft lined up with the runway can be an issue if there are crosswinds. So these are important factors that when flying, a pilot needs to keep in mind. Weather to fly by has six different activities. Air in the space it occupies, which object is more dense, how to make lightning, tornado in a bottle, making an anemometer, and detecting clouds using infrared, ener infrared energy. We're gonna do these in a little different order than what um, they have given us today as far as the, the list, 
And part of that is because I want to talk about first about making an anemometer. Now, an anemometer uh, is you, you, you measure the number of revolution a device makes in a given time, and that allows them to calculate the speed of the wind. Now, there are digital anemometers available, but, you know, if you've got students who are at home, kids who are at home, um, what are the chances that you have Dixie cups and straws? Okay, what about a push pin? And if you don't have a push pin, then maybe a stapler, although totally a push, push pin works better. And basically what you want to do is create this such that it will spin. So you use tape to secure the item and arrange the two plastic drinking straws to create a cross, four legs of equal length. Push a thumbtack at the center of the eraser of a pencil um, and then staple each cup to the leg. Notice that they are all facing the same direction so that the opening is here, 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 okay? And that's important because of how we want it to literally catch the wind and cause it to spin. Um, and then using a marker, you want to clearly mark one of the cups so that it can be differentiated from others while spinning. And that will be used to calculate the number of revolutions per minute. And if you don't have a marker, you can use like a piece of a black, uh, black tape. Um, and so what happens with this is that you can actually go through and um, calculate using a fan. And maybe you put the fan on low, medium, high, and they can do these different calculations. Um, so you can make this anemometer. Again, it's just like the real ones that people make um, uh, that scientists use. Uh, they have digital ones. But the other thing I like about an anemometer is that if you actually look at a weather station, they will be able to recognize the little cups that are on there that kind of whirl around. Um, and so it's, it's very easy to see. And you can experiment with this anemometer if you want to make it more of an engineering design process. What if we do this with little cups? What if we do this with big cups? Do we get a different, uh, different answer? So uh, some, some different things to look at there. So making connections, so we're going to make this um, connection out to the Shout mission, which was uh, a partnership with both NOAA uh, and NASA, and SHOUT stands for Sensing Hazards with Operational Unmanned Technology. And so one of the things that they did with SHOUT was part of the El Nino Rapid Response Experiment, and it was an unmanned team. Now, I will show you here because in a few minutes we're going to talk about drop zones, and drop zones, which is a scientific device that, that gathers measurements, comes out of the very back of this Global Hawk. So the El Nino, one of the things that they did was take, they took, um, they were able to look at sea surface temperatures. And the goal was to improve weather forecast by getting a detailed description of the state of the atmosphere. And that included temperature, humidity, and winds. And they did this by using the Global Hawk unmanned aircraft in special weather instrumentation. They flew between 55 and 63,000 feet. The duration was about 26 hours, and the payload was 1,500 pounds. They deployed from NASA Wallops, which is in Virginia, as well as NASA Armstrong, which is at Edwards Air Force Base. Um, and Global Hawk Operations Center, you can see there, I'm going to point that out right here. This is the Armstrong Flight Research Center. And so these guys that are in here are reading the data as it is being produced. So this here in the back are reading the data, but if you'll notice there's a window here, a partition, and up front here, those are actually going to be your pilots and co-pilots, which is pretty amazing to think that these folks are sitting on the ground while that's flying. So um, let's go on to this next slide here. So the different instruments, you've got a microwave sounder, participation, precipitation radar, the HD camera, and more in part, importantly for what we're fixing to see, where the drop zones are dropped. That is the tube by which the drop zones are released. So what a drop zone is, uh, it's a scientific data that's designed to take measurements of temperature, humidity, and winds. It takes two measurements per second, and it can take up to 88 per flight. And so what happens is, is whenever that drop zone is dropped out of the back 
of the global hawk, again, up to 62,000 feet, 55 to 62, they said, was their range. It releases, you'll see it's got a little bit of an inverted parachute so that it slows it just a little. And it's two measurements per second. And in the, in the process of falling to the ground, um, it, it gathers information every two seconds. And so what happens is they literally get a column of data, top to bottom. And here is the device that is loaded inside the plane. So this part here is what you can see coming out the back of the plane. And then the drop zones are in this cage here. And as they release one, another goes into the chute. So again, we'll go back. And back right here is where the drop zones come out. And this is what the machine looks like inside. System arm, system arm. Watch it one more time. Three, two, one. To release, release. And I think that's just amazing there how you can see the literal drop on being released. Obviously, they had a plane chasing it in order to do that. Um, but yeah, so I think that's uh, quite amazing as far as, but that's how they drop the drops on out there. This is a flying weather radar, again, using the Global Hawk, and it can measure precipitation and wind. So in addition to the drop zones, this here is actually using the uh, precipitation radar. And so it can literally fly through, and as it flies through, it goes at an angle and is able to tell um, the information all the way down to the ground. And you can see as it flies, it creates a swath which is just a, an area through which it can literally drive through or go through, and doesn't really drive through, flies over. Uh, there's also a high altitude monolithic microwave integration circuit, and that's a sounding radiometer, and that uh, gets pr specific profiles of the temperature and the humidity. And so you can see there, lower right, where the swath is, just how different Color, the many different colors that are there that make up as it flies through. So lots of different technology and measurements that can be made of hurricanes um, or you know any sort of weather system from high above. And then more importantly is that there's no one on board. I know that NASA also has a program it's in part with NOAA with the hurricane chasers where they actually fly I think it's a C-130 or something. I'm not, actually, I shouldn't say a C-130 because I'm not sure which plane it is, but I know that there is a plane that they fly into the hurricanes, but that's not what we're doing here with NASA uh, with the um, either the HS-3 or the SHOUT mission. We're taking an unmanned aerial vehicle, which means there's no human souls on board and flying above them. Um, you can see the different uh, track flights that they flew. Um, it's just, to me, absolutely amazing to think of where all they can fly within a 24, 26 hour period. Um, in addition to that, they're showing you pictures here of where they release the drop zones and then also the relative humidity. Uh, and so you can get the temperature as well as the, as well as the direction of the wind. And then uh, there's all sorts of questions that we still have in regards to hurricanes and what can we learn from them. So um, our job with um, NASA Shout is not finished. We still have much to learn, but there are activities that you can do within your classroom to help your students in making the connections with what NASA and NOAA are doing both through the Shout mission, the HS3, LIDAR. There's several different uh, missions that are out there. As a matter of fact, um, I have several videos at the end we won't get to today, but there are links to them that you can look at other activities uh, and research that NASA is doing concerning that. But now to look at activities that you can do in the classrooms with your students. Detecting clouds use in infrared energy. Now, satellites um, add color to enhance images and meteorologists use them to identify where the weather systems are located. The temperature of a cloud is a good ind indicator of its altitude. 
the higher a cloud is, the colder it typically bees. It, um, the high, higher the cloud, the colder it typically tends to be. Uh, typically warm clouds are a good indicator of poor weather and they're usually associated with rain. Um, and the relativity, which is uh, very hot clouds, are normally storm producing clouds associated with heavy rain and turbulence. So knowing the temperature of the clouds helps us to know the type of weather that comes with them. Now, if you'll notice on this picture here, I'm gonna go back a few, you know, you have some of those same pictures as they go across that little swath there um, as they are gathering radar information. So it's the same type of gathering data, but we wanna talk about detecting clouds using infrared energy. And so what you can do is knowing that cloud cover plays an important role within aviation, as well as reducing visibility for landing, um, dealing with the turbulence, by using satellites and adding color to enhance it, we can figure out where weather systems are located. And like we said, the temperature of the cloud is a good activity uh, as far as indicating where it's located at. This activity, you demonstrate how a satellite's infrared detector can see weather by creating a thermal image map. So you can see here that we have, um, looks like a cookie plate, a uh, cookie sheet, and then there's also um, one, two, three, four, five, six, looks like seven different styrofoam cups. And you'll notice they're labeled from anything from V cold, which is very cold, to V hot, which is very hot. So you've got very cold, cold, warm, hot, and very hot. And so you label the cups, and then you place them underneath of a cookie sheet and allow that cookie sheet to um, get warm or get cold, depending upon um, you know, what's underneath it. Don't let your students or kids see how you've arranged it, okay? You wanna arrange that and get that ready for them to come in. And what they need to see is this right here at the bottom, just the cookie sheet. And then what they're going to do is to take their hands and using their hands, gauge the temperature of the cookie sheet in various locations and use colored paper to indicate areas of differing temperatures. Decide which color goes with which temperature. Now, to me, the red absolutely goes with hot, but allow your students to make their own choices. They can decide that on their own, unless that's something you as the teacher or parent decide that you want to do. Now, personally, I prefer not to use pieces of paper, but I use post-it sticky notes. And so you need to be you know, you'll have to make your chart based upon the color of the sticky notes that you have available. Once the cookie sheet has been completely covered with paper, they say gently remove the sheet and compare the color coding to the markings of the cups beneath. Again, like I said, um, you know, I, I think that you would want to uh, maybe use uh, sticky notes so that they don't come off. So you can see how they were arranged here. And yeah, where the very hot was, which would be the front left and the back left. And yeah, we have that there. And then, of course, you look at the very gold and the folds. And of course, how you decide to use those, um, whether you use a coffee maker to make that heat or whether you uh, uh, increase the temperature um, by using a microwave or boiling it on the stove, please use safety with your students in that regard. Uh, make sure the adult is the one dealing with that hot water. Um, and then the next activity we're going to look at is air and space it occupies. Students observe that while in, oh, just a second, I wanted to go back to here. If you have a um, infrared camera on your, on your smart device, you can actually take a picture of the um, cookie sheet after it's had a chance to heat up as well. So if you have the technology available in that regard, then um, that's great. So, so with the um, air and space it occupies, students are going to observe that while invisible, air has mass and occupies space. In the activity, students will take an air-filled glass and attempt to displace air with water. In doing so, they will hopefully discover that two masses 
cannot occupy the same space simultaneously. And the other thought to that would be if you've ever um, played the game where you remove one chair and have people sit, um, yeah, two people can't sit in the same chair. You know, two masses can't apply the same space. So what you want to do is you want to fill a plastic fish tank with water. Obviously, if you have a gas tank, but a fish tank, you want to be able to see through the side of it. You say, well, I don't, I don't have anything like that. Then get the largest clear plastic container that you have. And then you'll want to get a clear glass um, and um, crush a dry paper towel into a ball and place it securely in the bottom of the cup. You may want to use a piece of tape to secure the paper there. Uh, depends on how well you can um, get it in there. Ask the students to predict what they think will happen when the paper towel to the paper towel once the glass is submerged into the water. Uh, and again, remind them they're going to submerge it upside down. Then what you're going to do, so that's step one right here. Step two is you're gonna take the glass and submerge it, boom, straight down. Now, as you hold the glass and invert the glass and slowly lower it vertically into the water until it's completely submerged, I don't show it here completely submerged, and you hold it there for a few seconds, what you're gonna find out is that the water does not reach the paper towel. And so then you want to remove it, pulling it straight up, remove the glass and remove the paper towel, and then they'll be able to see that the paper towel is still dry. Ask the students to think about why it's still dry. Repeat this same experiment, only this time, instead of moving the glass in straight down, put it in at an angle. As you do that, you'll notice that there are bubbles and it will gurgle. The air will escape and in doing so, as the air escapes, the water comes in. And then, of course, the paper towel will get wet. So the air in the glass prevents the water from entering. And so the paper towel stays dry um, because it's full of air. Um, since the air couldn't escape, the air prevented the water from entering the glass, again, because no two masses can contain, um, be in the same place at the same time. Uh, why did the paper towel get wet when the glass was tilted? Well, we allowed the air to escape, and in doing so, the water was able to take its place. Why didn't the water pass through the air in the glass to get the towel wet? Well, that's a great density question. And the reason that air has a lighter density than water, which means air is always gonna try to be above the water. And in this demonstration, the air was restricted by the glass, so it couldn't move farther upwards. So therefore, water was forced to rise. The water could not rise above the air uh, because the air could not go anywhere. So speaking of density, this leads us to the next activity, which is which object is more dense? In this activity, students will learn that even though two objects may look and feel the same and maybe even appear to be exactly the same, their densities may be, can be, might be completely different. Students will compare the densities of two soda cans that look the same, contain the same amount of liquid by submerging them in a liquid of a known density. That particular known density is water. But before we start comparing diet versus regular soda, let's talk about rock and styrofoam. I mean, if we ask students to pick up a rock and the same size uh, of the rock as styrofoam and then wonder why one is lighter than the other, the students would expect the rock to be heavier, you know? Um, density is used to describe the compactness of molecules within an object. You know, a solid rock weighs more than styrofoam, even if they are the same size, because rock is denser and the molecules, it has more molecules per cubic meter than the styrofoam. And part of that can be seen looking here at the molecules, how compact they are versus how spread apart they are. And density is mass per unit volume. So if the volume is the same, uh, you can compare the masses to know which one has the greater density. Pass two soda cans around the class, a diet one and a regular one. Ask the students to compare their similarities and differences. Um, and if you're not 
in a classroom, have your students at home, take a look at two of them and ask if they're, you know, what's similar, what's different. Um, it should be con con discovered and pointed out that the cans are the same size and they appear to be the same weight and contain the same volume or the same quantity. But if you place those cans of regular soda in water, students will observe that one sinks to the bottom while another floats. Ask the students to explain why the can of soda sink, sank. If necessary, guide the discussion in order to ascertain that the can of soda sank because the density of that can and its contents is heavier than water. Now the same is true with the soda can that's diet and ask them to hypothesize what they think might happen. And it's likely that they think that it's going to sink as well. And that's okay for now, let them think that. But then place the diet soda can into the water. Instead of sinking, it should float. Ask the students why they, the can floated when an identical can sunk. If necessary, guide the discussion so that the students discover that while the two cans are virtually identical, it's the density of the soda inside that's making the can float. The diet soda, while being the same quantity as the regular soda, is significantly less dense than the water, causing it to float. And my recommendation would be to choose the same brands. Don't choose a regular Coca-Cola and a diet Pepsi because then they may think that, ooh, Pepsi's just a lighter drink than Coke. Uh, so if you do a Coke, Diet Coke, Pepsi, Diet Pepsi, Mountain Dew, Diet Mountain Dew, Dr. Pepper, Diet, you know. Um, so discussion points, what's the difference between regular and diet soda that causes such a change in the density? Well, the answer is sugar. And instead of a much stronger uh, chemical sweetener, the large quantity of sugar adds to the mass and therefore the density. Um, you can note that the grams of sugar in a regular can of soda from the nutritional information on the can. The diet soda, by comparison, possibly uses aspartame, which is a chemical that requires just a very small amount to accomplish the same level of sweetness. If two cans of diet soda were glued together, would they still float? What if there was really one big can? Well, the answer is probably yes, but there would be additional mass from the glue when that means the overall density of the cans of diet soda would not change due to the additional quantity. As such, regardless of how much diet soda there was present, it should always float. The change in the quantity of an item doesn't change its density. So even if you use a two liter bottle, it should still float. So there's some for which object is more dense. Now, while having a clear fish tank to do this in is great. Um, if you had even a bathtub and the water was deep enough, I think you'd be able to see the difference between the floating and the um, being on the bottom floor or being on the uh, bottom. So um, even if you don't have uh, a clear container to do that in, just make sure that it's deeper than the height uh, of the can. So the next one is how to make lightning. And this is gonna be by creating static electricity. And students will learn how lightning occurs naturally in the atmosphere. Lightning is the discharge of electrical energy between positively and negatively charged areas in the atmosphere. It can occur with a cloud, between clouds, or between a cloud and the ground. Lightning is simply static electricity on a very large scale. Uh, and using the apparatuses on the next couple of slides, students can make their own lightning on a smaller scale. And before starting this activity, you may find it helpful to dim the lights in the room or to close blinds if possible, because the darker the room will provide a more dramatic presentation of whenever that little bolt of lightning is released. Whenever I say bolt of lightning is released, what I'm talking about is a little bit of static electricity. I can remember as a kid taking my sock feet and scooting them across the carpet and then zapping my sister. Um, yes, I do remember that. Or, you know, you may remember the build up static electricity by taking a balloon on your head uh, next to the hair and building up that electricity. And then whenever you touch someone else, that discharge. And it actually really does produce a little bit of light. So um, what you're going to need for this 
this this looks like a Mexican take, takeout container. And I don't know why I say Mexican. Yes, I do, because that's what I get my nachos in. That's what it looks like to me. That's uh, yeah. But you can also take a metal pie plan, pie, pie plate, pie pan, um, and just simply use a thumbtack to put it through the middle of it. The goal is to provide a way of picking up the plate without touching it. The pencil eraser insulates the plate from your hand. Um, a little bit later, we're gonna take and rub a styrofoam plate against um, the um, metal plate. Uh, and it may be that you want that uh, styrofoam plate to be um, uh, have an extra hole in it so that it provides a little recess for the thumbtack so that the styrofoam and metal plates, um, they need to come in contact with each other a little bit later. Um, and so you wanna take the styrofoam plate and rub it uh, vigorously next to the fur. The goal is to build up a layer of static electricity in the styrofoam plate. Um, and whenever we say the styrofoam plate, I'm referring to down here. So know that we're eventually gonna take this device here and place it down on the styrofoam plate. So it may be that you want to, like I said, create a little recess hole for the push pin to fit in. If you've got a flat push pin, there's no need for that. But if you don't have a flat push pin, um, then within the styrofoam plate, you want to make a little bit of room. And so um, you'll rub the styrofoam plate vigorously with against a fur. Um, and that goal is to build up some static electricity takes about 15 to 20 seconds to create that build of electricity. Once you've done that, you'll take the styrofoam plate and put it on a non-metallic table. The reason I say non-metallic is because you don't want to discharge uh, that static electricity onto the metal table. Using the pencil handle, pick up the aluminum pie plan and hold it approximately six inches above the styrofoam plate. Drop the pie plate onto the styrofoam. Be careful not to touch either plate at this time. Before completing the next step, have the student stand close to the plates as the spark, as the spark is quite small and hard to see. It may be that you wanna have a student videotape in slow-mo so that whenever the spark does occur, you can play it back and play it in slow-mo. Slowly bring your pointed finger towards the metal pie plate. Now notice I said your, I'm not asking the student to do this, I'm asking the adult to do this. And I hope that what you can see in that picture there, that's an adult's picture. So the teacher is gonna get the shock, not the student, okay? So a spark will jump, jump from the pie plate to your finger. And we've tried to simulate the little dash in there right here. And having the room darkened again will, will help you to be able to see this better. And so that literally is a little flash of lightning. Now, using the pencil, you can raise the pie plate approximately three inches above the foam plate. Using your other hand, slowly bring your pointed finger closer to the pie plate. And another plate, another spark should jump to your finger with the pie plate. What happened just before you touched the aluminum pie pan? A spark was created. Why do you think this happened? because of that buildup. Normally styrofoam plate contains an equal number of electrons and protons, meaning it's neut neutrally charged. But when the styrofoam plate was rubbed against fur, it took electrons from the fur and added them to the plate. As the plate has extra electrons, because they're negatively charged, it made the styrofoam plate negatively charged. When you place the pie plate on top of the styrofoam, the electrons in the pie plate want to move as far away as possible from the large quantity of electrons in the styrofoam plate. Just like with magnets, opposites attract, similar repels. When you put your finger close to the pie plate, the electrons in the pie plate saw a way of getting either farther away from the extra, extra electrons in the styrofoam, therefore leaving the pie plate entirely and going to your finger. It is in this transfer of electron that caused the spark. The electrons do this in an attempt to make combined unit of pie plate and styrofoam plate as close to neutral as possible. However, when the plates are separated, this leaves the pie plate negatively charged due to its lack of electrons while the styrofoam plate re re retains its negative charge. 
So why did we get another spark when we lifted the pie plate and touched it again? Well, when you first touch the top pie plate, the electrons belong to the plate jump to your finger, which made your finger negatively charged. This meant the pie plate had fewer electrons than it was supposed to have, which made it positively charged. After you lifted it away from the styrofoam, the pie plate, being positively charged, wanted the electrons back that it had given to you. So as you brought your finger near the plate, the electrons that had previously jumped onto your finger jumped back. So you wanna make sure that, again, the same person that is putting their finger out is also the same one below is the same one up top. How does it work in the real world in terms of how do clouds produce lightning? In simple terms, when two clouds rub together, it acts the same as when you rub the fur onto the styrofoam plate. Electrons from one cloud build up onto the other cloud. Eventually, there's too many electrons for one cloud to hold them and they decide to leave and head towards the first positively charged or neutrally charged body they can find, either another cloud or the Earth. How does this experiment relate to the flight of an aircraft? The majority of airplanes are made from aluminum, which is a great conductor of electricity. As they fly, the friction of the air rubbing past the plane causes static electricity to build up, which can affect the air, aircraft's communication and navigation systems. To present this, or to prevent this, aircraft are designed to dissipate static electricity by using small devices called static wicks. As their name implies, these devices channel the static electricity away from the fuselage of the aircraft and out on the wings and tail where it can be safely discharged back to the atmosphere. Tornado in a bottle, and yes, I realize I am almost out of time. Students can observe how a vortex is created and discover the basic fluid dynamics and hope you can just buy the tornado in a bottle uh, tube, and that's great if you have one, but if you don't, you can literally take and drill a hole into the middle of a uh, bottle cap and then using um, duct tape or electrical tape, secure that cap upside down. Um, and then that will uh, allow the bottle to be reused and refilled as needed. Uh, you want to fill a bottle uh, two thirds of the way full. Um, you might want to also add a couple drops of food coloring. Uh, it helps you to be able to see it easier. Uh, before starting this demonstration with your students or kids, show them a picture of a tornado. Ex explain that in very basic terms. A tornado is created when warm air tries to rise upwards through a mass of heavy, dense air. As it rises, it's replaced the denser air and heavy rain from above. The wind causes a descending air mass to start rotating, which when the conditions are just right, causes a tornado. This is a picture of a tornado in Kansas, May 23rd of 2008. Um, there is a video about um, using LIDAR and Hurricane Nadine. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm moving on. You can actually view that later at your own. Uh, there's also a Global Hawk high wrap uh, as it takes high altitude imaging of wind and rain profiles. And again, I'm gonna let you take care of looking at that later, but we wanna move on to the tornado in a bottle. So again, uh, if you have the tube that you can connect the two together, that's great. If not, using what we've described, put one above the other. And as this comes down, invert the bottle so that the bottle containing the water is on top. Explain that the water represents the dense air and rain and that the empty bottle represents the warm air. Um, as uh, you invert the bottle, you'll notice that just a thin intermittent stream of water enters the lower bottle. Um, and then um, the water is more dense, mass than the air in the bottle below. And therefore, it's always tries to sink below a less dense matter. However, it can't do so in this case as the air in the loader bottle has no means of escape. The gulping noise is the sound of the air forcing itself past the water through the combination of vac vacuum and gravity. Start swirling the bottle assembly. Notice I said swirl and not shake. You want to start swirling it slightly round, and as that rotational speed increases, 
you'll notice a water vortex will form in the upper bottle and water will start flowing smoothly into the lower bottle. Ask the students why the water is now flowing smoothly. The swirling water is creating what's called a water vortex. And that vortex is a funnel shape uh, with a hollow center, just like a tornado. As such, the air from the bottle, bottom of the bottle can now pass unrestricted through the center of the vortex into the bottle above. Um, you can have the students invert this back and forward, remembering to give it a gentle uh, swirl in the process. Um, other places where you might have seen this before, you'll think about uh, the drains of maybe the bathtub or the sink. Um, and the water, you know, whenever you have water in the swing, it's quicker whenever it swirls around the bottle. As the water rotates, the hole in the center grew larger, which allows for more air to pass through. Since the air can escape quicker, it allows the denser water to descend faster. So by having that little tornado shaped in your sink drain, you're allowing water to drain faster. Always have your students report out about what they do with these uh, six different weather to fly by activities. And I wanna say thank you so much for attending.